Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us again for another important and hopefully breakthrough discussion with three great people that I've spoken to on multiple occasions. And essentially this came about because after speaking with Gert on the 24th of uh, December and his predictions, I then had a conversation with Dr. Um, Rob Renenbaum, because he's been following Gert's work and we were trying to dissect some of it. And we thought, listen, when we are trying to work out any kind of clinical thing, we've got to have Dr. Chetty involved. So we've got three people today who are able to bring a clinical insight, research insight, and hopefully try and give some degree of logical interpretation of where we are now and what this means and critically what we can do. So let me bring everybody to the stage so that they can introduce themselves. And we've got Gert, we've got Rob, and we've got Shankara. So as usual, Gert, a quick introduction, just in case somebody doesn't know who you are. You want to go ahead? Well, yeah, first, uh, thanks, Philip, for having me. Uh, my name is Geert Vandenbosch, and my background is uh, veterinary uh, medicine. Uh, early on in my career, I specialized in uh, virology and uh, immunology, primarily in uh, human diseases. Uh, that was uh, to begin with in academia. I then uh, moved on to industry where I uh, uh, initially worked in lay development, more kind of like project management, regulatory environment, uh, moved on to um, research and development, uh, where I took a deep dive at two uh, big uh, vaccine companies in uh, adjuvants and uh, alternative routes of uh, vaccine delivery. And I then worked uh, also in vaccine discovery with global health uh, organizations. I was a senior program officer of vaccine discovery at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Also uh, worked during the Ebola crisis in West Africa a number of years ago with uh, Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, where I was the uh, Ebola program uh, manager. And uh, I also uh, yeah, worked on uh, natural killer cell uh, vaccines. That was uh, my uh, own uh, project. So uh, uh, I consider myself as a problem solver, uh, uh, putting the pieces of the puzzle uh, together. And that's why I'm primarily uh, emphasizing the, the kind of several different disciplines I touched upon, rather than explaining uh, the detail on the different institutions and universities where I uh, worked over. Excellent. And uh, Rob, you want to go ahead? Yeah, well, I'm a pediatrician and a pediatric rheumatologist. Uh, I received my MD degree from the University of California, San Diego in 1972. Then I did a pediatric residency at Dalhousie University and IWK Children's Hospital in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And then I did a fellowship in pediatric rheumatology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And then for 21 years, I was chief of pediatric rheumatology at, at Ohio State University and Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. And then I uh, was a clinical professor of pediatrics and pediatric rheumatology at uh, Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary, Canada. And then I finished my career uh, at the Cleveland Clinic where I practiced pediatric rheumatology and developed an international uh, consultation clinic for treatment of a rare autoimmune disease called Susak syndrome. I retired about five years ago, but then uh, within a year, COVID happened. And for the past four years, I've been really intensively studying and writing and learning uh, about COVID. Excellent. And um, Shankara? Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Shankara Chetty. I'm a natural science biologist and a general medical practitioner. I did my natural science training at the University of Witwatersrand initially in genetics and advanced biology. That seemed to cover a lot of facets of biology itself. I added microbiology and biochemistry later on at the University of Nichal, and then was invited to study medicine at JSS Medical College in India, where I qualified as a medical doctor. I've been working as a general medical practitioner now in a private practice in Port Edward, South Africa. And uh, I took the time as a frontline COVID doctor 
to have a look at the pandemic and try and look at the clinical nuances of the illness itself and try and tie it into the underlying pathophysiology to help dictate the treatment I would use in patients and, of course, to guide research in future uh, uh, into where we need to go with the pandemic itself. Excellent, excellent. So, yeah, so the reason we're having this, so um, if anyone doesn't know me, I'm, I'm Dr. McMillan. I'm a physician in the United Kingdom. I've been focused on COVID-19 since early 2020, primarily from the autoimmune perspective. And I've had the pleasure of speaking with experts across the world for the whole duration. And it's been an incredible journey and we have learned quite a lot. Now, where we are at the moment is actually very, very concerning. And I was saying to everybody beforehand that it almost feels as if public health across the world just has no idea what to do next. And there is this silence where there is nothing that is being said, nothing is being done. Um, the People are not getting vaccinated. People don't have any options. It, it, this, to me, is setting up to be a disaster. So let's just clarify again from Gert. Tell us what is it that's making you so concerned about this phase of the pandemic? Well, Philip, um, I would say in a nutshell, I could, I could basically summarize this in one sentence. What is extremely from the very beginning, in fact, um, worrying me is that we don't have herd immunity. So the virus continues to evolve. The virus, you know, continues to be uh, transmitted. And um, it's very clear from all the observations from the mutation spotters that the virus continues to evolve and that this evolution it has now become really a function of the immune pressure that is exerted by the population. I mean, this is largely acknowledged. This is not new. This has been published early on that uh, initially we had, um, let's say, these converging mutations that were clearly by molecular epidemiologists were due, uh, according to their analysis, were due to the uh, immune pressure exerted by the population. And um, we have, even after the advent of Omicron, everybody thought, well, Omicron is going to be uh, a blessing. But uh, basically, after the immune system, uh, you know, got an opportunity to catch up a little bit and uh, to make the, uh, the disease, uh, well, in some cases, even asymptomatic, we have seen that still, after vaccine breakthrough infections, for example, the immune system was still not capable of controlling the virus. And the virus has continued to evolve. And um, what we see right now, to get a long story, sh uh, long story short, is that we, are, we have seen that the virus became more and more infectious, which was, in fact, pretty logical since most of the immune pressure uh, was exerted on spike protein, and spike protein is responsible for viral infectiousness. Uh, but recently, and, and that is where, again, once again, I was uh, ringing the alarm bell uh, when I heard about mutations uh, in GN1, this descendant uh, from BA286, that was characterized not only by additional changes in spike protein, but primarily also by changes in other viral proteins that were, for me, very clearly reflecting uh, that the virus is uh, experiencing immune pressure no longer on, on you know, specific epitopes of spike protein, but on its infectiousness in general. And uh, now, you know, you remember at the beginning, everybody was saying, well, GN1, uh, it's highly infectious and it becomes more and more dominant. That's what we're seeing right now, that, you know, uh, it, it uh, continues um, to, to dominate and it's prevailing in, in more and more countries. But uh, what we have seen uh, as well is that, uh, you know, whereas people were initially saying, well, don't worry too much because it's more infectious, but there is no proof whatsoever 
that it is also more virulent. And what we are recently seeing in, in a number of publications is that people are now showing that due to you know, some mutations, for example, these flip mutations, the virus is more fusogenic. So there is more the fuso, fuso, fusogenicity, for those who don't know, is correlated, so to say, with the virulence of the virus. And uh, that is very, very strange because initially nobody was saying, well, you know, the GN1 could be more virulent. And now all of a sudden there is this findings in vitro that it is more fusogenic, which would be correlated to, you know, more virulence. And um, uh, what is very interesting is that I al I've always been saying that since the advent of Omicron, where we had this, remember, antibody dependent enhancement of infection, that these very same antibodies that would enhance the infectiousness of Omicron were also protecting against virulence. Now, if you start to analyze this, for example, in vitro, so in the absence of the virulence inhibiting antibodies, you will see, of course, that you have these indications of enhanced virulence, fusogenicity, whereas you will not see them in vivo, in the field, as long as people have, you know, high enough concentrations of these non-neutralizing antibodies. What it illustrates for me now, the fact that we have these rising rates of hospitalization and deaths in, in a number of countries, in, in many countries actually, is that most likely the concentration of the non-neutralizing antibodies starts to decline so that now the picture in vivo is more and more reflecting what people are seeing in vitro in the absence, of course, of the non-neutralizing antibodies, namely that we are starting to see, you know, indications of enhanced virulence. All this taken together is for me simply confirming what I have been predicting already a long time ago, that once the virus would have achieved its maximum infectiousness, and according to a number of virologists, the, you know, the, the level of infectiousness that GN1 has now achieved is really maximum. Many of them are saying it's, one cannot imagine that the virus could even become more infectious than it is already. When that stage is achieved, in order for the vi and the virus is still under pressure, there is still pressure on viral infectious never and transmission, is that the virus will now shift to enhanced virulence to, you know, whereas, you know, uh, in, in the beginning or whereas before, it was enhancing its intrinsic infectiousness to transmit, to increase the chances of transmission from one person to another. It's like it's now increasing its chances of disseminating within the body itself to ensure its continued propagation. So this is very, very worrisome for me because it's simply, in fact, confirming what I've been predicting based on my analysis of the immune pressure put on the virus. And now it becomes obviously more and more reality in a sense that according to my humble opinion, the increase that we are seeing right now in hospitalizations and death rates is for me the prelude only to a massive, a massive change that the virus will undergo to overcome collectively, not just in a limited number of people, but to overcome collectively the immune pressure that is now put on viral virulence by virtue of the declining concentrations of the non-neutralizing antibodies. So okay. I'll stop here and leave it, you know, to questions or further comments, whatever. So uh, before I bring in Shankara to give a clinical perspective, uh, Rob, because you've been following Gert's work for uh, a long time, I, I want you to try and again, because Gert sometimes uses very complex terminology. Can you, can you, so the, at six year old, can you try? Okay. <clears throat> well, and, and I'm talking at the moment about highly vaccinated uh, individuals whose immune status has changed and is different from the immune status of unvaccinated people. Uh, <clears throat> in the highly vaccinated 
population. Their immune system has made uh, three major adjustments to, uh, to uh, protect the highly vaccinated from a very infectious virus. One of those protections is the uh, polyreactive non-neutralizing antibodies, the PNNABs that Geert just mentioned. Those are the virulence inhibiting PNNABs that protect primarily the lungs and the internal organs from being invaded by the virus. So that's one adjustment the immune system has made in highly vaccinated individuals. A second adjustment <clears throat> is to produce uh, what Geert refers to as sir created uh, broadly neutralizing but fairly weakly neutralizing antibodies. And these compensate for the fact that the initial neutralizing antibodies uh, have, uh, uh, have not worked very well because the virus has uh, learned to resist uh, those antibodies. So the sir created antibodies have been helping highly vaccinated individuals to control the infection. The third adjustment that the immune system has made in highly vaccinated individuals is uh, <clears throat> active, massive activation of, of uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which can directly kill uh, virus infected cells. Uh, those three mechanisms have uh, done pretty well to protect highly vaccinated individuals uh, during the Omicron era. But the problem with those three adjustments is that they are unsustainable, they're unstable, they will eventually fail, and all three of those uh, adjustments will cease at some point to be able to protect the highly vaccinated individual. While they've been protecting the highly vaccinated individual, those that's given the illusion, but it's a false impression, that <clears throat> the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is not that virulent or not that severe, not much worse than even a common cold. Uh, but that's an illusion. And, and that illusion is due to the fact that those three mechanisms I mentioned uh, have been protecting uh, the highly vaccinated people very well. There's a fourth thing that has happened uh, in the highly vaccinated individuals, and that is that the innate immune system, particularly the NK cells, have been sidelined uh, due to the uh, vaccination uh, effects. And so that means that the highly vaccinated people have not been relying uh, on NK cells and have not involved NK cells, have not trained their NK cells or given their NK cells a chance to become trained and practiced and experienced. So <clears throat> when those three uh, protective mechanisms uh, cease to be available, um, <clears throat> uh, the highly vaccinated individuals will not have those protective mechanisms any longer, and they will not have trained their innate immune system uh, very well either. Now, in contrast, people who are unvaccinated have not been relying heavily uh, on those three mechanisms that I mentioned. Uh, they, their protection against SARS-CoV-2 has not depended on uh, uh, high levels of, of PNNABs, the virulence inhibiting PNNABs, and have not depended on uh, high levels of sir created antibodies and have not depended on uh, great activation of CTLs. And uh, be, because they've not been uh, relying on those mechanisms and have been exposed to these very infectious uh, variants, particularly during the Omicron era, their uh, innate immune system has become uh, very well practiced, very well trained, and, uh, and that's a huge asset uh, for those who are unvaccinated. So what Geert is saying is that we are coming very close to the point 
where <clears throat> those protective mechanisms uh, those those immune adjustments that the marvelous immune system made um, are, are going to cease to be available uh, to the highly vaccinated individuals. And most importantly, it's the virulence inhibiting PNNABs that are going to be uh, uh, no longer available because those levels will drop. Um, but all three of those mechanisms will cease to protect the highly vaccinated individuals, particularly in highly vaccinated countries that were rapidly vaccinated. So what Geert fears is that we are on the verge of experiencing a surge of a variant that is capable of being very... Uh, uh, causing very severe infection, particularly in the highly vaccinated individuals because they don't have much defense left uh, compared to the unvaccinated. And so he worries that that's going to create uh, a devastating amount uh, or number of, of, of hospitalizations and potentially deaths, uh, particularly in the highly vaccinated individuals who've been left at that point, largely defensely. Yeah, great, great. Uh, Shankara, I want you to put a little bit of a clinical uh, spin on this. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, Philip, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm already seeing patients presenting with uh, severe viral infections that are pre uh, creating prolonged illness and are becoming very difficult to treat. So I think from uh, what Kurt and Rob have said, uh, we're going to see some very difficult cases. Uh, we got a mishmash of vaccine, uh, I mean, immune uh, res responses to the virus itself. So we don't know uh, how the patient's going to actually react. In the unvaccinated, we understand uh, the, the, the res immune response. But the vaccine seems to have jabbed our immunity in the eye and left it without the ability to recognize future pathogens. And so what, what we're dealing with is a vaccine that trained the immune response too well to one epitope, the, the receptor binding domain. And because it was trained so well, it keeps recognizing that. So when we're getting new variants in, it's using the wrong antibody to try and kill that variant. Whereas a natural immunity restructures itself, retrains itself to all the new variants that we see. So we're using an antibody from the vaccine that is suboptimal. That is what we, and that's where the development of uh, uh, the, the non-neutralizing antibodies come from. So it's like, just to put it in context for people, Philip, imagine a virus is a human being and the way we identify it is through facial recognition. So immunity recognizes the virus and makes an exact antibody to that virus, to that face. The next time a virus comes in, facial recognition takes over, it recognizes a new uh, face and makes a new antibody to it. But now what's happened, we made so many antibodies to this first face that we've, that we've uh, seen that every other face that comes in gets the same mask slapped on it. And when you go down the road and develop poly, uh, these uh, polyreactive non-neutralizing antibodies, that is like not, not recognizing the face of the virus, but recognizing hands. And then you see, oh, it's got hands, it must be a virus. So you, you tie its hands, it stops, it stops infecting so badly or causing such severe illness, but you're not really killing the virus. And that, that's where we got this problem. We're going to end up with chronic viral infections. And of course, we got the hyperimmune issues that come with the vaccine. And, of, and as well, with the damage to the immune system, we're going to see all the opportunistic infections showing it. So we're going to see some very complicated cases going forward. Yeah, that's right. Gert, anything that was said before that you want to clarify so far? Uh, yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> I think it's um, what, what people need to understand is that the some of the, as, as Rob was pointing out, some of these immune mechanisms that are in place right now are indeed not sustainable that can be immunologically explained. And, um, but it's not like all of a sudden, this kind of immunity is going to appear from one day to another uh, in all of the population. 
So it starts to decline. That is where you reach suboptimal levels. And that is where you start to select some variants that are able to overcome the suboptimal immune pressure. And I think the most, what, it, what may be difficult for people to understand is why would you all of a sudden have this spectacular mutation that I'm talking about? It is because nevertheless, when you consider, you know, the, uh, the entire population, if you consider the entire population, there will always be still a big chunk of the population that is protected and that is relatively well protected, uh, for example, you know, against the transmission, against the disease, etc. And this will hamper the propagation of the virus, even though some people have already lost that immunity and the virus can cause in a certain percentage of the population, for example, severe disease, what we are seeing right now, as Shankara was pointing out, still the bulk of the population is still enough protected to kind of generate a very annoying situation for the virus in terms of ensuring its survival and its propagation. And that is, that is where the virus, just as we have seen with Omicron, will all of a sudden, really all of a sudden, undergo a spectacular mutation to make sure that now it can overcome the residual defense mechanisms that were still existing in the, all the rest of the population. That is what the virus needs to do to ensure its propagation. And then what is also, second point, and then I will stop, very important for people to understand is that whenever you have an infectious virus that can cause, you know, that can destroy cells, you know, that is cytolytic, and many viruses are cytolytic, and SARS-CoV-2 is a cytolytic virus. So whenever you have a virus that can infect and destroy cells, and you have no longer sufficient immunity in place, uh, as Rob was pointing out, innate immunity didn't get trained and the adaptive immunity got derailed, then every single virus, again, that can infect cells and destroy cells in the absence of sufficient immunity is per definition highly virulent. People always think, you know, there is this aspect that conditions infectiousness and then there is this aspect that conditions the virulence, etc. If you take away the immune response, the immune defense, a virus that is infectious, <laughs> viruses, living viruses are infectious, and that can destroy cells, is per definition going to become highly virulent. And that is my fear that once we will have reached this point where the virus will have undergone this dramatic mutation that will overcome the last line of immune defense that is still in place and that we know is not very robust, as again, Rob was pointing out, that then what we will see is just a huge, a huge wave of severe disease. Over. All right. Now, so Rob, use your clinical head now, even though it's primarily with pediatrics. Just think about it. If, and I always say if, uh, because we always hope that Gert may be wrong, even though we've seen how right he has been. If this occurs, um, Rob, what do you anticipate that it could look like? Um, we can do that, Philip, or would you like me to kind of review the cytokine storm concept first? Sure, sure, sure. Which slide do you want me to use? Uh, well, the first one. <laughs> okay. And by the way, uh, the relevance of my being a pediatric rheumatologist is that children with uh, systemic juvenile rheumatoid arthritis uh, very often develop a cytokine storm situation. Probably 10% of them uh, go on to develop even recurrent episodes of a cytokine storm. We, we also call it a macrophage activation syndrome. And so for, for 40 years, pediatric rheumatologists have been dealing with cytokine storm, macrophage activation syndrome, trying to help these children uh, who develop this problem. 
and uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, and we've we've done uh, randomized controlled trials on how to intervene and bring uh, this macrophage activation syndrome under control. So uh, our experience as pediatric rheumatologists turns out to be quite relevant to the severe COVID uh, situation. A cytokine storm, or you can call it a macrophage activation syndrome, or you can just simply call it a hyperinflammatory reaction. Uh, it represents a, a, uh, a hyperinflammatory state in which both the innate and the adaptive immune system are excessively activated. And this is associated with excessive production of cytokines, uh, pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. And we're primarily talking here about macrophages that become excessively activated and they produce large quantities of pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-18, IL-1, IL-6, TNF, the most important of which is the IL-18, interleukin-18, but also the CD8 positive T cells, cytotoxic T cells are also <clears throat> excessively activated and they produce notably interferon gamma, uh, which I'll explain in a minute but also NK cells uh, produce interferon gamma. They're, they become excessively activated and even CD4 positive uh, T helper cells become excessively activated and they also produce interferon gamma. And if you'll go to the next slide. Yeah, so the pivotal cytokine that is uh, released by the macrophages uh, is IL-18. Um, and the IL-18 in turn promotes the production of interferon gamma by the CD8 positive T cells and the NK cells. And interferon gamma uh, <clears throat> then stimulates further activation of the macrophages, which then pour out more IL-18. And you can see that there's a, an ever escalating vicious cycle. And that's what we why we call it a cytokine storm. Uh, it's a hyperinflammatory state characterized by these very high levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. In the next slide. Uh, so this just shows the macrophages become excessively act activated. They produce IL-18 and other pro-inflammatory cytokines, which in turn stimulate the CD8 positive T cells and also the NK cells, and they produce lots of interferon gamma, which then in turn further heightens the activation of the macrophages. Now the interferon gamma uh, is, is a, a, a critical antiviral mediator, and so is IL-18. So one good thing about the cytokine storm is that it uh, gives the person a chance uh, to fight off a severe viral infection. The flip side of it though, is that uh, these very high levels of cytokines can do, a, and all of the inflammation that it creates can do a lot of damage to internal organs, to the lungs, the heart, the liver, uh, systemically. So a cytokine storm is kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, on the one hand, it creates a, a very powerful and rapid onset of antiviral activity. Uh, and that can be a good thing, particularly if you're dealing with an overwhelming viral infection. But very soon after it gets rolling, and particularly if it escalates further and further, uh, it can do a huge amount of damage uh, and, and it becomes potentially lethal. So as pediatric rheumatologists, we've learned to uh, recognize when a cytokine storm is developing and we've learned how to shut it down before it causes irreversible and life-threatening damage. Now in systemic onset juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, this is a spontaneous, often a spontaneous cytokine storm that is developing. Although in some of those children, it's a viral infection that triggers it off. But a cytokine storm can be triggered off by any viral infection and indeed has been triggered uh, by uh, influenza, 
uh, viruses and a number of other viruses. And <clears throat> the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, is very capable of triggering off a cytokine storm situation. And <clears throat> getting back to what Geert is concerned about, it, it makes sense that if you don't have much defense against a virus and you're dealing with a highly infectious virus, it will infect an individual uh, and the individual will not have any defense against it. You'll get a very high uh, load of virus that will overwhelm the immune system. It, it's less likely to overwhelm the immune system if, if uh, you have a, a healthy, robust, innate immunity and a well-functioning adaptive immunity. But if you do not have a well-trained uh, innate immunity, and if your adaptive immunity is derailed, uh, you may not be able to handle uh, this highly infectious uh, virus, and it will overwhelm the immune system. And one way to view the cytokine storm is that it's the immune system's way of, in desperation, in an emergency, when it doesn't have much else that it can rely on, it kind of throws the kitchen sink at the, uh, at the viral infection. Um, it, it massively activates virtually the entire immune system and you get this, uh, you get a lot of pro or a lot of uh, antiviral activity going on, uh, but it's that double-edged sword. Um, just one more slide, and then we'll get to, to your second question, Philip. Yeah. Uh, oh, this this slide just explains how physicians in the hospital or in the ICU can recognize that a cytokine storm is brewing, and can uh, quantitate the extent to which it's a severe cytokine storm or just a mild cytokine storm or something in between. The, the first several blood tests are very simple blood tests to do. You can get the results back in a half an hour. Uh, the, and the most important one is a serum ferritin level. And people who are experiencing a, a cytokine storm, macrophage, macrophage activation syndrome, hyperinflammatory state, they will have uh, high levels of serum ferritin, their CRP will be elevated, and you can go on down the list. Those are ways that doctors can figure out whether a cytokine storm is happening and how severe it is. And then the next slide, uh, <clears throat> particularly over the last 20 years, uh, pediatric rheumatologists have learned how to shut down uh, a worrisome cytokine storm uh, the main two medications that have turned out to be the best and the safest and the most effective are corticosteroids. And you have to use an appropriately bold dose of corticosteroid, uh, depending on how severe the cytokine storm is. And then the other medicine, which I think is a wonderful medicine, is anakinra. It blocks IL-1. Uh, now, IL-1 isn't as pivotal as IL-18, but it's amazing how if you can block IL-1 with anakinra, you can shut down the entire cytokine storm process. Uh, it's almost miraculous the way it works. But again, as with the steroids, you have to give uh, an amount of anakinra uh, that matches the severity of the cytokine storm. And the nice thing about anakinra is it's short acting. Uh, it is, it, there's a very uh, wide range of, uh, of therapeutic doses. You can, you can give uh, one dose a day, you can give one dose an hour. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility with it. And that's why I prefer anakinra to toxilizumab, which blocks IL-6, um, <clears throat> uh, but it's not as flexible. And then the latest medicine that pediatric rheumatologists have been using to shut down a cytokine storm is imipalumab, uh, which actually blocks the interferon gamma, but that's 
that's a very new approach. It's a little more dangerous approach. It's probably a more effective approach, but that hasn't become a routine uh, treatment. And there may be, uh, there, are, there are drug developments uh, in the process uh, that will block IL-18. Uh, so anakinra and corticosteroids are the main way we shut down a life-threatening uh, cytokine storm. Now, getting back to your other question about what, if, uh, what we can anticipate uh, clinically uh, if, if, uh, if and when a more virulent variant arrives on the scene, if you can go to the next few slides there, Philip. Next, next one. Yeah, this one. These are six different uh, graphic depictions of how a COVID illness might behave in different patients. The first two are pretty much what we have seen in uh, COVID up, up to the present time. Uh, the, the third and fourth graphs depict what Geert is, is very worried about. And the fifth and sixth graphs depict worrisome situations, which, however, can have a good outcome. So if we go to graph one, uh, that, that's a typical course. The blue line is the viral load, and the white line is the immune response to that viral load. And so in that graph one, a <clears throat> person gets sick with, the, with, with a modest viral load, and the immune system reacts to it. And thanks to the immune reaction, uh, the viral load uh, uh, settles down and then the immune reaction uh, settles down as well. And that can play out over the course of the, well, the viral phase, usually lasts seven to 10 days. <clears throat> and then the immune reaction lasts a little bit longer to make sure that the virus is well handled. So graph number one is what Shankara has mostly been seeing and what most doctors see and what most patients experience to date when they've gotten COVID. Graph two <clears throat> depicts uh, a hyperinflammatory reaction that unfortunately gets triggered in some patients, sometimes necessarily, but often not necessarily. Uh, in other words, it can be kind of a mistake that the immune system makes because it's wanting to be protective, but sometimes it's overly protective. And also there may be some genetic predispositions that make certain people more likely to flip into a hyperinflammatory phase when it's unnecessary. So in graph two, uh, <clears throat> you get the same kind of a viral exposure. Uh, and the immune system reacts as usual, but then on a, about day eight, it instead of settling down because the threat is largely met, uh, it flips into a hyperinflammatory reaction to varying degrees of intensity. And <clears throat> that's why uh, Shankara at around day eight watches for evidence of graph two evolving. And if he senses that the patient is starting to develop a hyperinflammatory state, he immediately puts them on uh, an appropriate dose of prednisone to try to prevent that from escalating. And by the way, the pink arrow indicates uh, uh, intervention uh, and if you have a severe cytokine storm, we would intervene with corticosteroid and anakinra. And then the dotted line shows that that would bring the uh, cytokine storm under control uh, and normalize the situation. So graphs one and two uh, show uh, good outcomes if properly managed. Fortunately, graph one has been by far and away the most common way that COVID has been behaving up till now. And graph two has been just a, 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 a minority of patients. Um, now, graph three is what Geert is very worried about. Uh, what I've depicted there is a sudden, very high 
load of virus that invades uh, the person. Um, <clears throat> and the white shows that there's not much of an immune response because uh, uh, if you're not able to mount a, a good immune response, then the virus just goes wild. And the reason the virus uh, blue line comes down to zero is because that patient uh, dies from the overwhelming viral infection uh, <clears throat> with the cytotoxic effect on so many cells by the virus. And <clears throat> obviously if the patient dies, then the virus dies with the patient. So we certainly want to hope that graph three will not turn out to be a common phenomenon, but, but that's one scenario that uh, Geert is very worried about and that we need to at least be prepared for. Hopefully that will be a, a minority of, and a small minority, but it may not be a minority. Graph four shows <clears throat> the blue line goes up much higher than it has been to date. And that's because of the highly infectious nature of the, uh, of, the, the, of the recent variants. Plus, if the PNNABs are no longer able to uh, protect the lungs and the systemic organs, uh, then the virus will run rampant. And it makes sense that if there's that huge a threat from a highly infectious and highly virulent virus, the immune system is going to have to pull out all the stops and do whatever it can in desperation, particularly if its innate immune system has been hampered uh, and if its adaptive immune system is derailed. Its only choice uh, to try to protect the patient is to throw everything at the virus. In other words, a cytokine storm. And so, and not just a mild cytokine storm, but a hugely intense cytokine storm. And if you then start, and then the doctor has to make a decision of, well, on the one hand, I need to give that cytokine storm a chance to, uh, for, to show its antiviral effects and bring the viral load down. But on the other hand, I can't allow this horribly intense cytokine storm to go on for too long because it's going to be life-threatening in and of itself. So at some point, the intensivist uh, needs to decide when to get aggressive and treat with corticosteroid and anakinra, for example. And the dilemma is, as you can see, if you bring it down, as I've shown, the viral load is, is, is still pretty high. And so there you're, you're, you're faced with two life-threatening situations, a life-threatening cytokine storm and a life-threatening viral infection that has not been eradicated uh, despite the intense cytokine storm because of, 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 of such a huge load. So graph number four depicts a very worrisome clinical situation. Uh, and again, we hope that that is going to be the case in a minority uh, of patients. Five and six graphs show uh, a less worrisome situation, <clears throat> uh, but, but, but a more difficult situation, obviously, than graphs one and two. In graph five, you see there's a very high load of, of, of the highly infectious and, and potentially very virulent virus. And there is also a very intense cytokine storm reaction that the immune system wages to try to save the patient. And in that particular graph, you can see that fortunately the cytokine storm uh, <clears throat> had enough of an antiviral effect that it brought the viral load down to zero before uh, we, the physician had to jump in and shut down the cytokine storm. And <clears throat> uh, so in that scenario, graph five, uh, the cytokine storm could be shut down before it caused irreversible life-threatening damage. And the virus infection, uh, fortunately, 
came under control before you had to shut it down. So, so five, the graph five shows what would be a good, a good outcome. And then finally in graph six, uh, you have a, an above average viral load, even could even be higher than I've shown there. But then you have a cytokine storm, which nicely brings that virus under control and then is able to spontaneously shut itself off so that you don't even have to intervene with uh, steroid and anakinra, for example. That's what I've shown in, in, uh, slide, or in graph six. Uh, that's asking a lot, however, of the immune system to be able to shut down a totally out of control hyperinflammatory state. <clears throat> um, in pediatric rheumatology, we do, however, see that happen. Uh, there are kids with systemic onset juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and other auto-inflammatory disease, diseases where they have a huge cytokine, cytokine storm uh, that's very threatening and we're about to intervene, but then it spontaneously subsides. So, of course, those are children and children's immune systems are... are uh, are better at uh, correcting mistakes that they make, but they also make mistakes to a, a, uh, a more intense degree. So <clears throat> uh, graph six would be uh, a scenario that would be, uh, could, could have a, a good outcome if, it's, if the patients are managed carefully. Now in all of those graphs, um, I wanna point out that I'm assuming that all of those patients would be treated with antiviral agents at the onset of their illness, so that you're also having antiviral therapies that are trying to uh, control the viral infection and you're not depending entirely uh, on the immune system. One final comment about those graphs is, I'm assuming, I mean, those graphs are all talking about patients who uh, are only dealing with a severe SARS-CoV-2 infection. One of the problems that we've alluded to earlier is that there may be patients who have co-infections and they may uh, not simply and only have SARS-CoV-2 with a hyperinflammatory state. They might also be at the same time harboring other infectious viruses or other pathogens, including fungal infections or bacterial infections, mycoplasma, and they may have co-infections. And so another complicating factor in, with all of those graphic depictions is that they may be complicated by uh, additional infections going on. Uh, that is such a comprehensive overview, Rob. And I realize now it, it it's so fascinating because Shankara demonstrated that just by aggressively managing the cytokine storm with steroids and antihistamines, none of his patients died. Imagine if the medical community was utilizing some of, well, it did use one or two, but it was probably too late. It needed to be using it right at the beginning of the cytokine storm. But what I wanted to ask Shankara about is, the, the lung cytokine storm we can see because the person is short of breath. What happens when the other organs are involved? The kidneys, the heart, the, the, the brain. Any, any thoughts, Shankara, clinically? I think, uh, Philip, we're going to see a multi-system disorder if the immunity can't handle the virus that's there, for one. So you're going to see the virus infecting a myriad of different organs in the body. But also the cytokine storm, if not managed well, in itself will cause multi-organ failure. So we're going to see patients going into multi-organ failure, and we need to understand why that's happening. I think the two most important things going forward is understanding the effective antiviral treatments we might hold in our toolbox to negate that surge in viral load in patients that have, let's call it immunocompromise. And of course, the other part to it is to find ways to timelessly detect and negate a cytokine storm at the appropriate time. That would, that would be the, 
the uh, that would be the methodology for almost any viral infection that has lethality tacked onto it. The ability to trigger the cytokine storm is directly linked to its lethality. And so if we can get a better understanding of how to judge the onset of a cytokine storm and the relevant medication to actually negate that storm, that would be the, the best thing to be treating patients. Uh, if we don't have an antiviral in, unvaccin in vaccinated patients with poor immunity, we're going to see viral infection run rampant through their body. And if we don't find ways to curb the cytokine storm, then we're going to see multi-organ failure. The cytokine storm is there to kill the virus, but it's a natural mechanism where if it does not kill the virus, then it will attempt to kill the host to save the rest of the population. So that's where a cytokine storm is a double-edged sword. Yeah. And, and Gert, when you think of antivirals, do you include the um, some of the major pharmaceutical ones, Paxlovid? Uh... Well, Philip, the, 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 the answer is no, because, you know, what you have to think about is, and, and frankly speaking, you know, I, I don't care which antiviral it, you know, it's the only, the only possibility we have is to prevent the infection. But if you think about it, you know, you will need an antiviral that, you know, is safe, is very, very safe, right? It also needs to be widely, widely available. Look how many countries we have been vaccinated. And, and you know, I, I think maybe this was before our session, uh, Shankar uh, pointed out, uh, it doesn't make sense to do this in a, in a few countries. You need to do this uh, globally. And then it also needs to make, make, be made available at affordable cost. I mean, these are three points, three things we all agree upon. Affordable cost, sufficient supply, uh, it needs to be uh, safe and widely available. Uh, we, we don't even need almost to, to talk about efficacy, but we know that is monoclonals, right? That is what is the virus has been working on, is to develop resistance against those monoclonals. So obviously the, the, the other medications we are talking about have like multiple pathways where they can curtail the you know, synthesis and the production of the virus so to, you know, abolish productive infection. And, um, you know, if we have several different mechanisms that can be combined uh, and do this, I think, you know, in terms of efficacy, we have a, a much uh, higher chance of being successful. But don't forget the practical limits, uh, the availability, the, the price and the safety of, uh, of the, the antiviral drug that should be used to tackle this, you know, massive, uh, widespread, large-scale problem. It, it raises, yes, Garob, go ahead. Well, the reason for going over those graphs is to show how important it is for us to prevent this infection in the first place. Yeah. I mean, rather than focus on ICU care, of patients who never received antiviral therapy in the first place uh, or didn't get prophylactic uh, antiviral therapy and just uh, focus on ICU care is, uh, is not a good strategy. Uh, <clears throat> we need to prevent people from uh, getting into those difficult scenario situations that, uh, that those graphs depict. So those graphs justify focusing our efforts on preventing particularly the most vulnerable people from getting uh, infected in the first place. And that's why we need to talk about not only effective antiviral treatment that can be started on day one of people getting ill, uh, but also talk about prophylactically treating people, uh, particularly if they're exposed to others uh, or are in communities where there's lots of virus circulating or, or uh, healthcare workers who are exposed to the virus all the time. Our number one uh, emphasis should be on prevention of, of people getting infected with 
with these upcoming uh, worrisome uh, variants. So, and, and I think it is high time that doctors like us stop feeling hesitant to mention ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine as very reasonable options as antiviral agents. There's been a culture developed where um, we have been hesitant to mention ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine for fear of being ridiculed or even losing our medical licenses for Pete's sakes. Um, and we need to stop feeling uh, hesitant to declare that uh, ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine are very appropriate options as both prophylactic and acute phase uh, antiviral agents. Uh, we need to publicize the fact and point out to physicians who've been told that the only antiviral therapy that they should recommend is Paxlovid, we should point out that, that, that uh, ivermectin, for example, has been far more extensively studied than has Paxlovid. There are dozens of randomized controlled trials that have shown the effectiveness of ivermectin, lots of observational controlled trials. In vitro studies have shown that due to a variety of mechanisms, it has antiviral properties. Dr. Omura, who discovered ivermectin in the first place and was awarded a Nobel Prize for, uh, in medicine for the uh, discovery and effective use of ivermectin to help people in Africa with river blindness, Dr. Omura uh, is is very impressed with the potential of ivermectin to serve as a as a prophylactic and as an acute phase uh, antiviral therapy. Um, in and on top of that, there are a dozen or more countries that very wisely early in the pandemic. Uh, implemented a, a, a widespread ivermectin distribution program. Uh, Uttar Pradesh, for example, in India, a state of 231 million people, um, implemented a, <coughs> a, a, a prophylactic and early treatment with ivermectin campaign. And uh, it, it was very impressive how it reduced the number of hospitalizations and deaths. And that experience has been played out in several countries in South and Central America. Uh, so there's lots of evidence of different sorts that uh, suggest that ivermectin um, uh, can be a very effective antiviral agent. In contrast, Paxlovid was granted emergency use authorization on the basis of one randomized control study. And <clears throat> the safety of uh, Paxlovid is a bit suspect. The efficacy uh, of, it's not convincing that Paxlovid is any more uh, effective as an antiviral agent than ivermectin. It's been very difficult to sort that out uh, because unfortunately we've never had a head-to-head -head comparison of ivermectin compared to Paxlovid or remdesivir, uh, which would have been a logical thing to do early, as early as possible in the pandemic so that we would know how, how effective they are comparatively. We do know that ivermectin is safe. We don't know that Paxlovid is safe. We do know that ivermectin is cheap and can be widely uh, distributed. Paxlovid is quite expensive. So, and complicating matters further is there's been so much conflict of interest involved in uh, a lot of the uh, studies of the eff efficacy of uh, medicines like Paxlovid. Um, 
and it makes it very difficult to even interpret uh, the medical literature anymore. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd like to hear from Shankara what he thinks about uh, what, what he thinks would be the most effective uh, prophylactic antiviral approach and what he thinks would be the most effective antiviral approach on day one of people who come down with COVID. You know, and, and Shankara, when you're looking at that, do you think that the medical scientific community will be able to backtrack because there has been so much negative um, press about this to say that actually we did make a mistake? Will they be humble enough to do that? And even if they did, could it work at this point? I think, Philip, if you're in this profession to save your patients' lives, then you should be willing to accept your faults and backtrack. Bottom line, it's not about your ego. It's about the patient in front of you. And so, unfortunately, uh, we make mistakes and we must be willing to admit to them and redirect. And I think that's going to, that's going to be a huge problem. Uh, to, to look at what Rob was saying, uh, Paxlovid, useless. Uh, it's uh, too expensive. It's, let me say that uh, we've had rebounds, so I'd say it's uh, virostatic rather than virucidal. And so it stops the virus, but take the drug away and the virus grows again. So I don't think it has the virucidal effect we're looking for. Uh, the drugs that we do have in our toolbox, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, have been proven to have uh, antiviral effect. <clears throat> but I think, uh, Philip, where the, where the solution would lie is not waiting for patients to become ill and attempting to treat them because in that case they still are reservoirs and spreading the virus to other people we need to stop viral spread on a global scale for a period of time so that this virus will dissipate and be no more now to do that we do have drugs that have proven efficacy like ivermectin in the in the Uttar Pradesh uh, uh, scenario uh, it, it, it managed to stop the pandemic. Uttar Pradesh was one of the countries that never had all these waves and the problems that the rest of the world experienced. But when we talk safe and effective and cheap, there's ivermectin, there's hydroxychloroquine as antivirals. And of course, uh, Dr. Cyclin showed benefit in inhibiting protein synthesis. Now, when we look at where we need to go, we need to look at what we have not try and develop new uh, unusual drugs that are not cost effective and no safety behind them. Now, for a, a simple thing, Philip, here in South Africa, in the first wave of the pandemic, I looked at doxycycline for its ability to inhibit protein synthesis at the ribosomal subunit, and it's an antibiotic that's been used in patients for an extended duration of time. I mean, we give patients with acne uh, doxycycline for periods of six months to a year. So we know it's long-term safety benefits or efficacy. So I started giving patients a three-month script of doxycycline at the start of the pandemic with vitamin C and, uh, with vitamin C and aspirin. And I, I, I must have given, I think, 300 different patients that script, Philip. And what happened, what transpired, a lot of them were teachers and policemen that were forced to work during the lockdown, essential services. And they were terrified of going to work. And so I put them on doxycycline just as profile access to see if we get a benefit. And it was one school and one police, police station close to my area where a lot of these people are my patients. And three months went by and I repeated the script. And then when the second wave came by, I got people from other schools and other police stations coming to me to say, we want that script. So I said, why would you want that script? And they said that was the only school and the only police station that was not ravaged by COVID in the first wave. And people said you gave them a script. Now, okay, it's anecdotal. But we've got a lot of tools in our toolbox as it stands. And all we need to do is research this and figure out the most effective ones. And they will have a safe, effective, cost-effective medication. But, of course, it's unpatented and not economical to the people that make the drugs in the first place. And that's, where, that's what we need to get out of. We got a toolbox full of tools. All we need to do is understand how they work. We don't need to develop new drugs for this. Yeah, and uh, you know, Gert, as we, you know, as we continue to evolve in this pandemic, and the disappointment that you must feel looking at the scientific community that you've been a part of for so long, where they're willing to 
in effect, step back and let these things happen. Has that surprised you? Well, <clears throat> Philip, I, I, had, uh, I had some kind of warning. I've been talking about this multiple times. A small scale warning like eight, nine years ago with the Ebola crisis. But it was very, very similar what happened there. And, uh, you know, but it was small scale. So, uh, but even there, there was no reaction, was no feedback, there was no, uh, you know, acknowledgement of uh, mistakes and, uh, you know, people wanting to correct the situation and, and doing something different. Uh, it's all uh, about large talks about, you know, pandemic preparedness and all these type of things. So, um, yeah, when this thing came, th that was the reason why I was so self-assured to immediately ring the alarm bell because I knew that uh, this is the way things happen and, and that is how it is, you know, managed by even the scientific medical community, etc. cetera. So um, I don't know how we, how we, uh, how we are going to change this, how we can change this. Uh, I personally also disagree that there are 25 different approaches to the science of such a complex problem. Uh, I'm the first to say, okay, we, 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 we had to open the debate. Nobody engaged really in a debate. But on the other hand, I uh, also don't think that there are, uh, as I was saying, 25 different correct approaches. Even if you see what we are talking right now, it seems like we can streamline this and we can narrow this down to very, very clear, very clear and very, <clears throat> very simple recommendations, right? So um, this complexity uh, is, is something that is, uh, looks to me very, very artificial uh, from day one, in fact. And um, yeah, where... I must say I'm not surprised because that is the way, uh, you know, these pharmaceutical companies and, and if, you, if you start making these things, you know, this uh, infrastructure and the hierarchical structure very complex, you, you end up with, you know, some very, very complex solutions that are not really solutions. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I was not surprised. And I knew from the very beginning that uh, even... You know, even though we would cry and, and shout it from the top of the roofs that there was a high likelihood that it would not, it would not really have, uh, have an impact. But now the situation is different because I think right now that there is a lot of people, you know, on the other side that are really panicking about what could possibly happen. Because it's very clear, if, you, if I look right now at the different publications, et cetera, that there is a number of highly ranked scientists and experts that are no longer ruling out that we may be, you know, we may be um, facing a very, very worrisome and difficult situation with an unpredictable uh, change of uh, of the virus in in a direction that um, that we don't want to see. In fact, and there is no plan B. That is the problem. There is no plan B. Uh, you know, uh, we know that uh, just masking up and uh, lockdowns and uh, it, it's not going to be a solution. And um, we also know that uh, continuing, uh, you know, the vaccination will be very challenging as well if you are facing a very acute uh, situation. Yes, I think that um, this this is this has been fascinating to listen, especially with um, Shankara being so specific about some very simple, practical outcomes that could actually be scaled across the world very quickly. So, as we we come to the end, I'm going to want everybody to almost try and think about how do we get this kind of approach and information in a place where it can can make a difference because this is the we don't have much time you know a lot of people the virus is circulating very highly there is very little time before we hit a problem with irreversible organ damage for a lot of people 
Is there anything we can do? What are the final thoughts? I'll start off with uh, Rob, then Shankara, then back to Gerd. Well, one thought that occurs to me is we need to mobilize physicians uh, en masse as a large group. Physicians have been very passive in accepting the prevailing narrative and the prevailing recommendations uh, because they've apparently trusted those as being wise and scientific. And the result has been that they haven't taken Geert's work seriously, for example. They, they have scoffed at uh, uh, use of ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, uh, without critically examining uh, whether that is justified. Uh, but there's been a very passive acceptance of <clears throat> uh, not embracing the, the understandings and the actions that should emanate from those understandings. Uh, so I would like to challenge the, the medical profession itself uh, particularly the physicians to, uh, and I'm talking about the, the vast majority of physicians that are in private practice or in academic medicine, and ask them to please uh... sorry. <laughs> They need to resume <laughs> their critical thinking, their compassion for their patients, and their courage and their hard work to figure out how they can help end this pandemic the way it should be ended. Thank That's you very thing. much, Rob. Thank you. And Shankara? Philip, uh, I see a flood going forward, like you, uh, like you have mentioned, and and Kurt and Rob, and I think uh, yeah, uh, Rob is right. Uh, a lot of physicians sat back and took a back seat in this, and I think it was the agenda to ensure that we never figure out the complexity of why people are dying. It would have helped us uh, in saving lives. It was the reason we weren't allowed autopsies. So I think there was an agenda. But uh, coming back to what Robert said, I think a lot of the my colleagues who are averse to early treatment during this pandemic have realized the wrong in their ways. And so physicians, uh, general practitioners now seem to be more willing to intervene if this happens again. But I think those of us that uh, uh, had input uh, uh, in the pandemic, that's that's. Uh, on at the moment should be the ones to offer guidance to these practitioners who want to make things right. Uh, everyone makes mistakes. Uh, we all will be forgiven. But I think it's for us to early on put out an understanding of how to treat and negate cytokine storms, for us early on to put out the, uh, the antivirals that uh, might be effective in the pandemic so that they have in their toolbox, something to give them courage to step out and treat patients when the storm arrives. Uh, unfortunately, we've got the regulators that lack the will. But with the work that I've done, Philip, I think it's important to realize that we can make a difference in spite of the regulations that might be in place. And I think that's where doctors need to be. Uh, get up, stand up, and... Uh, make retributions for the mistakes that you've made. And I think we will all survive it. Uh, I think as well, Philip, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety uh, that impacts on our, our immunity. Uh, so I think people need to strengthen their immunities, get out, get some sunlight, and make sure you're surrounded by positive vibrations to get your immunity back on track. Excellent. And Gert? 
Yeah, well, I very much agree with, uh, <clears throat> you know, with regard to what uh, Rob and uh, Shankara were saying with regard to the medical community, but I would also like to call on the scientists because their insights and what they are publishing also has a tremendous influence. And what I have been seeing is that for many scientists, this has been just a, a huge opportunity uh, you know, to make publications and to tease out all kinds of molecular details uh, to make yet another publication. And publications are very, very important. But when you're dealing with an acute situation as the one that we have been experiencing and, and, and that we are still experiencing, I think they have also a very important responsibility and a very important task in, you know, uh, consulting together in order to make, for example, also models that are reliable, that are, you know, uh, taking into consideration several different um, uh, aspects and several different disciplines that has not been done. And I think they uh, also have a huge responsibility and I still hope that they uh, can help us, uh, you know, to shift uh, gears. But um, as you were pointing out, Philip, and that's my last point, it is, it is, you know, more than time. I don't know if it is still time because I just wanted to point out, you know, when we have seen this massive wave of Omicron breakthrough infections, remember, it was preceded by sporadic vaccine breakthrough infections due to previous variants. You know, we saw a number of vaccine breakthrough infections already with Delta, etc. And then all of, of a sudden we had this huge wave of vaccine breakthrough infections with Omicron. This is similar to what we are seeing right now. We are seeing already a number of virulent vaccine breakthrough infections, but not a massive wave. But it is the prelude. And I think with regard to what Shankara and Rob were saying, treating people in a prophylactic way with antivirals, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. I think we need to do it now. I don't think personally that we have still time to wait. And it would, of course, be fantastic if uh, we could convince leading authorities of this, um, you know, um, the, the need to do this and, and to act right now in, in start of keeping talking. Over. Thank you very, very much. And as I said, what a pleasure to hear um, you three gentlemen again coming together, sharing insights, bringing ideas. This is the picture of what we need to help us, not just for the pandemic, but for health generally. How many diseases do we need to also apply similar kind of thinking for? So thank you very much again, gentlemen. Um, just stay with me while I do the outro. Thank you, those who have been with us. I hope you found this valuable. Have a great evening.